Welcome into a new Buff Stampede Radio. Adam Mustager, the publisher of BuffStampede.com, here to recap Colorado's 2023 football season with football analyst William Gardner, Buff Stampede staff writer Sean Niehoff, and 104.3 The Fans' Matt Smith. Let's go 2023 defensive MVP. This might be a little bit more split than the last vote. Yeah, that's me starting for defensive MVP. This is a tough one for me. You know, I I think it's hard to go with anybody other than Travis Hunter, but I kind of want to do defensive MVP without Travis Hunter. At least that's how I'm going to do it um, because I think Travis is clear. I mean, he played, you know, over a thousand snaps total. I mean, he was sensational most of the time as a cornerback. Now, I certainly think we can have that conversation, you know, about, you know, where he needs to grow, but I- I'm going to go with Trevor Woods. I am. I mean, this is the guy who stuck around and he was unselfish enough to switch positions where he was coming from being an NFL prospect as a safety to now moving up to play linebacker. I would have been a really tough call for me to make mid-year. Like even being a team guy, an unselfish guy that I don't feel like put him in a position to succeed, even though he could do it. And so I think his leadership, he garnered almost everybody's respect immediately. He was one of the faces of the defense right away, and he made plays, right? So for me, I got to go. I don't know that they win the TCU game without Trevor, and, you know, he had a big one against CSU too, right? So right. Um, for, for me, I got to go Trevor Woods all day. Yeah, this was a tough one for me too, but but I kind of fall into the the same, you know, end of line with you, Matt. Um, and, and it you know, it wasn't tough necessarily because of the unit's performance, but I just don't think there was a clear cut standout, just a lot of really good individual performers. Um, like you said, I obviously think you can make the case for, for Travis Hunter by far the most talented player on the defense and, and on the team. Um, you can make the case for Shiloh. He was probably the leader of the defense, but you know, for me at least as, as frustrating as he was good. Um Cam Ward, I think, made, you know, made a big impact when he got inserted into the lineup. And I love the style that he played with. Cameron um, Sutton, correct? Or, or no, Roderick Ward, sorry. Oh, there um, yeah. Roderick Ward. But in Cam, Cam was actually maybe my favorite player on the defense, right? Um, but uh, you know, un- unfortunately, most of all of these candidates are coming out of the secondary too, which tells you a little something about the the defensive challenges up front and, and at linebacker. But like you, I'm actually going to say Trevor Woods. I, I think that his intellect and his versatility were instrumental uh, to the defense progressing throughout the season. And I really think that the the unit seemed, seemed to take a step backward in those last few games of the season when he was out. And and that's that's one of those areas where I think his absence really highlighted what he brought to the defense. So like you, I'm I would I would name Trevor Woods as my defensive MVP. And y'all probably saw me uh, break into a big smile when my uh, brother from another mother met said Trevor Woods because I was like, man, this guy he keeps he got he, he's in my head or something. But uh, <laughs> at three for three, Adam, I, uh, I was going to go with Trevor Woods myself, and I I, I think that uh, to me, you know, two two game saving end zone interceptions, nobody else had that. Um, and then as, as Matt pointed out, you know, the, the, the willingness to come up forward and it is not an easy transition to move from safety to linebacker because inside linebacker, everything happens so fast. I, I liken it to standing in the middle of the, of the, of the interstate and reading the cars that are coming at you. Right. Good luck with that. And it's a lot different thing. It's safety because you're 10, 15 yards back. You have some time to make things happen. And he said, he, he came up and uh, did a pretty credible job up there. And uh, I, I agree too, that the, the secondary court took a step backwards when he wasn't back there, almost as if he's the leader of the group and, you know, he can hit, he can, he, He's a, seems to be one of those guys like like Tedrick Thompson was, who was in the right place and makes big plays uh, that other people don't make. Um, but I would have picked him just on the basis of those two end zone interceptions, quite frankly. And 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 I think that TCU pick was was that the whole season, that whole early part of the season, doesn't happen without right. that play, you know. And so uh, surprisingly, we all come down on the same guy, and it's not Travis Hunter, except for Adam. Who you got, Adam? Yeah, we don't all come down on the same guy, and Trevor Woods is one of my favorite buffs, so I don't uh, enjoy having to uh, have a different answer than you guys. But I would say Jordan Dominic 
based off what he did on a consistent basis, especially as the season went on, I felt like he got better in run protection or run stopping as well. And he's somebody that there were, there were a handful of guys defensively. If you look at the start of the season to the end, there wasn't one play where you questioned their effort. And Jordan Dominic was very high on that level of a guy that was a playing with next level aggression. I thought that, Travis Hunter, while at times that he would sometimes let his fundamentals as a lockdown corner wane a little bit because he would cheat a little bit, and it, and it certainly paid off for the Buffaloes. Uh, that's why I didn't go with him. Uh, there were just a, a few too many lapses with, with Trevor Woods. I love the, the team first mentality to go to linebacker. Uh, another guy that I hope that he is part of this program going forward, Omarion Cooper was a guy that had – those mental lapses, but again, to my earlier point, you never questioned his effort level out there. He always seemed to be playing with that that next level of aggression that you need as a defense going forward. So uh, those are some guys that stood out to me. Omari McNeil was underrated as, as a player on the defensive side of the ball. I think Shane Cox was underrated based on all the hype that we heard, but there were a lot of things he did, you know, holding up blockers that were allowing Vaughn to – Bentley to make big plays in the second half of the season that maybe went under notice for him. Um, and a guy I'm really looking forward to the future is Jaden Milliner Jones. I think that he's going to be kind of that Omorian Cooper where every once in a while you want to tear, if you have hair, tear it out. But uh, I think he's a guy that, that I'm really excited to watch going forward on defense. Let's jump into special teams, guys. Who is your I, special? I, 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 I see, I see that I, uh, Dominic was the only other guy I had. Okay. Was, was Trevor Woods and Dominic? That's 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 the two I had as well, and for similar reasons. What about a special teams MVP? Uh, well, I don't think there's any. I don't know. It seems pretty obvious to me that Mark Vassa would be the pick there. Um, although I I, I got to put in a plug for my guy Mata. Love that kid. Is best dancer on on the team. But uh, uh, <laughs> you know. Watching watching some of Vassett's punts, you know, some of those, I swear to God, those punts down on the goal line sometimes, I, I swear to God he had a remote control in him and he could just make them kind of weasel out right there at, in front of the pole, the, the flag there. And um, he, cha- he he gave us every opportunity. He changed field position for us so many times. I, I, I think that, uh, to me, unquestionably, the, per- the, the MVP for special teams is punter Mark Vassett. Yeah, I think like the offense and defense, there were a lot of positives from that group, but uh, the whole special teams, but also countered with with negatives and disappointments, right? I, I liked the flashes we saw from Jimmy, uh, from Weaver, even Dylan Edwards at times, um, maybe not a whole lot of consistency, but some excitement that, that I don't remember having uh, out of a special teams unit in, in several years. Kicking was a bit of an adventure all year long, as well as Mata did. Um, there were a lot of other struggles with kickoffs and 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 other pieces of that unit. So I think Vassett was was probably the most consistent weapon and had the biggest impact on the team from a from a special teams perspective. Um, even you know even saying that he was still a bit bewildering at times. It seems like uh, every game there was there was one shanked punt that uh, that you're you know, kind of questioned and, and where did that come from? But his overall body of work, especially with his punts inside the 20, um, put him at a, at the top. And, and, you know, that's probably another indictment of the offensive challenges that uh, of this team that he was called on as often as he was in that role. But I also want to give a special nod um, on the special teams to, uh, to go to Cavosia smoke. Um, that guy yeah. was exceptional on the coverage teams. And it's one of those areas that, that doesn't make, uh, you know, doesn't make a lot of stats, doesn't make a lot of highlights, but, but I think he, he might've been the, uh, the next guy up after, after Bassett from a consistency and a, a standpoint in terms of making plays. And if, and if you know, to, to follow up on that, here's a guy that does not get to do what he came here to do he didn't hang his head. He didn't act like a little baby on the sideline. He found a way to make a difference to the team, and I'm glad you mentioned his name because that that's a man right there. Yeah, and he did make his voice heard on the way out the door, right? I mean, I mean right. He, did, he did voice a little bit of his displeasure on the way out the door. Um, Bassett has to be the guy. 
you know, I think he got better throughout the year overall. His consistency got better. Now, to Sean's point, there were still a couple in there where he didn't have the biggest leg, right? So if it it, it always felt to me if if they were close to midfield or maybe even a little bit across midfield or you know, right before it, that was when he was at his best. He wasn't at his best, like kicking from his own 25. Those weren't like the big punts that you're like, wow, look at that 60 yarder that roll. No, he was good at, you know, he's more of an accuracy guy and they could be so lucky to have a guy like that next year. Right. Like there were a ton of games, you know, I can't remember specifically, you know, I couldn't like point and choose, but there are a ton of moments this year in games that they lost that, that weapon alone should have probably won them the game, but it didn't, right? Like the Arizona game, they pin them all the way down, and then they drive all the way down themselves at the end of the game. There are a bunch of situations where if you have a better team and you put him on a better football team, I mean, he alone could have won you football games with the way that he flipped the field and was able to, you know, kick accurately this year. So, yeah, I'm with you there. Special teams, obviously, there's a there's a whole laundry list of things we could talk about. The other one I want to shout out is Xavier Weaver, because I thought it wasn't until Weaver got in there at punt returner that they did anything. I didn't understand why Jimmy had gotten that job out of camp. There were just, I thought, some better options. And it, then it wasn't until the end of the year where Jimmy actually, I felt like, like really tried. You know what I mean? Like he, he he struggles to break tackles as as it is, but his best kick return wasn't until or punt return rather wasn't until the Utah game, and it looked like it was just a different guy out there to me. So I I I think Weaver stepped in against Arizona State, and I mean without him they don't win that game. So I agree with you guys. Mark Bassett is the choice there. It, it's interesting covering these games. You're kind of in work mode, and then I have like an hour drive home. And I remember just really being pissed off after the Stanford game that that should have been the Mark Vassett game right there. Right, where right, he pins right. them down at the one yard line. I was like, man, for a punter, it couldn't get any better than being the biggest part of a win in a conference game. And so uh, that was frustrating. I do want to throw out Jeremiah Brown's name. Mm. He wasn't a gunner and he wasn't as prominently featured as a special teams guy in terms of replaying uh games but he played almost 200 special team snaps this year it was second on the team behind Jaden miller jones jeremiah brown did not have any missed tackles on, on coverage units which is pretty rare when you think about that's really when the defender is at the disadvantage because you're in space and uh Jaden Milner Jones, who played more special team snaps, had some of those lapses. And Jeremiah Brown, zero missed tackles on special teams this year. So that's going to be a, a, a 1B from me. Let's go uh, 2023 most underrated award. My winner has already been mentioned, but I'm curious what you guys have to say. I guess I'll start here. Um, probably, probably it's it. I want to go with Amari McNeil, but I kind of want to say Levante Bentley because Bentley got a lot better throughout the back half of the year. And as an inside linebacker finished with five sacks. And I thought, you know, being the only linebacker that they trusted to stay on the field, you know, for the majority of the season, he loses his job early, comes back, earns it back. Obviously Juju with that situation, which is by the way, that Juju Mitchell thing. I wonder if we figure out what happens in the documentary. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm fascinated to see what happened there, and I feel wow. like that's an easy one to include in the doc. If, but who knows? Anyway, um, Levante Bentley or Amari McNeil, but I'd probably have to lean with Bentley. Yeah, and I I kind of split mine a little bit offensively and defensively, um, and I don't really know if it fits for underrated, but maybe underappreciated. Um, so offensively, that's that's Hank Anthony Hankerson. I, I think he was underutilized and by far the best combination of of running ability and pass protection that CU had in the backfield. Um, so I think you know based upon the way the offense developed this year, um, he, he just was underutilized and and I think underappreciated. And defensively, I'm right in line with you, Adam. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Omari and Cooper. For whatever reasons, he seemed to find himself in the doghouse uh, quite often and disappeared toward the end of the season. But he played well on the targeted side of the field when he was opposite Hunter and as, you know, kind of the cornerback 1B when Hunter was out. So uh, people will always come back to the, the slip in the Stanford game that kind of started that landslide. But uh, I think his, his entire body of work was underappreciated. And I got, I got to go, I got to start out with the same guy as Sean. It's like, and, and I, I'm mystified that this guy doesn't get more love, but Anthony Hankerson, every time they gave him the ball, got something done. He made yards, man. He didn't get tackled in the backfield. He picked up blitzes. 
you know, I mean, I think people all think, well, a running back to be a great running back has to be able to go 90 yards every time. And he's not that guy, but so what, you know, you know, some of the best running backs in the history of the NFL were not speed guys. They were guys who could, who had patience and could find holes. And, you know, when you gave the ball to Anthony Hankerson, he would find three to four to five, sometimes 15 yards, you know, and, and I just think the guy is a great all around back and he's a great team player. And, you know, he's another one that's kind of stuck, stuck here uh, from the last regime. And, and I think could be a real leader in, of this team uh, moving forward. He might be one of those 30 year guys, Sean, next year, who really does sort of start to pick up the leadership role because, you know, one of the things to be a leader, is you got to play a lot and he plays a lot. So Anthony Hankerson to me is that guy. And, I, and I'm just sort of mystified that, he takes a lot of heat from people that I don't think is, is warranted. And then I, I have, a, I have a, a and B on defense as well. I mean, Amari McNeil by the end of the season was as good a defensive tackle as there was in the conference. And I, I don't, I don't know what people seem to, I guess everybody thinks you're not playing good at defensive tackle unless you got 10, 10, you know, tackles behind the line and three sacks and whatever, but that's not what the modern defensive tackle does for the most part. Um, and along with him, I got to say, Shane Cox had a lot better season than people think he did, you know, and I guess there was a lot of hype about him preseason and I guess everybody's expected 10 sacks, but as Adam, as Adam alluded to Shane Cox took up a lot of blockers, man. He made, a, made life a lot easier. A lot of guys got a lot of single team uh, blocking against them because they were double team and Shane Cox and he was handling it. So um, all three of those guys, I'm, I'm going to say to me, are significantly underrated by the fans and by the people that follow this team. And I guess part of it for me with McNeil and, and Cokes, man, I watch the lines. I don't want, I, I mean, I focus on the lines and I watch what those guys do. And I don't think anybody else does to for the most part, because that's what I like. But uh, those would be my three guys. I want to go with Cameron Simmons, Craig here. And, and I don't know, maybe he's, too on the radar to be a candidate for this award, but there were many moments this past season where he made momentum changing plays. And um, I, I know that he didn't finish the season making as many of those big plays. A lot of this was when they were winning early in the season, but he was somebody, uh, and I was kind of torn. I almost thought you guys went with Anthony Hankerson. I thought that so Savion Wilkerson as well, when yeah. he was consistently given carries he would get the first downs. He would get the touchdown. He would move the chains. And uh, Matt, he met with us late in the season and said, he was very frank and said, I can't the believe reason Brian the running gave game, us a running back. <laughs> the reason the running game's not working is because I don't get the ball enough. It was the bottom line of that message. And I, I kind of agreed with him. And you saw that early in the Utah game. It's like, man, if we just ran Savion Wilkerson 25 to 30 times in this game, I would feel pretty good about this offense standing on the field. Uh, uh, but uh, Cameron Sillman Craig was a guy that I think should be a, a bigger name for this fan base going into the off season. And maybe I'm just kind of a sucker for those little guys that do better than they should. He's uh, he is a dog as, as coach prime likes to say, I mean, he's kind of the definition of that. If you want to look at more of an underrated type of guy uh, as opposed to Travis Hunter being the, you know the high profile guy let's go with uh our best interview it, did, did somebody want to chime chime in there I'm not really I don't really do interviews I thought it was going to be me but uh <laughs> <laughs> just just real quick though Adam on, on your point you know with both I agree with you on Simon Wilkerson and then you know with Anthony, Anthony Hankerson I think so many people thought that Elton McCaskill would come in and run for 2000 yards that they don't give those other two guys the credit that they deserve. I would also like to mention Mikey Harrison's name in this yeah. in this yeah. conversation because I mean it's been a while since CU's had a productive tight end and every time his number was called you know receiving not not necessarily blocking but receiving every time his number was called he was productive and they don't win the CSU game without him. He was masterful in that game, and had they consistently played him, he could have had a really, really big season. So I got to mention his name because, I mean, for a former walk-on receiver, that's good stuff, man. He right. only had, was it one or two drops the entire season? I mean, he was probably their most consistent in terms of catching the ball coming his way. Yep. Him or Weaver, yeah. All right, let's go. Oh, oh okay, best interview. So Best Matt and I are on, on the beat, but you guys, William and Sean, who do you like want to tune into a video for so we can kind of have this all inclusive? 
Well, well, the guy, the guy that always seems to have something funny to say to me is Bishop Thomas, and and you guys probably are around it more often. But Bishop, to me, just seems like a funny dude, man. <laughs> Adam and I shake our head. We didn't get Bishop Thomas one time this year. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to interview him, though. He yeah. seems like he's a funny kid. He'd be yeah, a wild he, card for sure. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. You see him on those videos. There was one video during the summer where they were going against the offensive line. He just jawboning the whole time. It, it just was funny. So yeah, I I only got to interview a few guys and only set in on on I think one one of the press conferences at, at the start of the season. But uh, you know, from from the few that I did, I I enjoyed interviewing. Uh, Anthony Hankerson. I, I thought he was he was a, a sharp guy, had a lot to say and 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 was very thoughtful from uh you know from just like the the fans perspective and watching interviews. Um I would I would give my best interview award to uh to Shiloh Sanders. I, I think that yeah his his personality um is is a great interview but uh, so it's a good mix of of a unique personality a lot of a lot of fun but also some some pretty good insight and i think he's a little more open to uh to kind of sharing some off the cuff more honest uh uh thoughts than uh, maybe the rest of the sanders family is uh for me adam all right, I kind of want to give a player and a coach, right? I think for for coaches, it's got to be Andre Hart, right? I mean, he was probably the most, you know, outside of Coach Prime, clearly, but Andre Hart was definitely the most entertaining. You know, always really nice guy, always good conversations, even if he did throw us a smoke screen with the Des Moines Kennedy stuff uh, late in the year there, and and you know the Juwan Mitchell stuff. But so that would be that would be that, and then um, for player, that one's tough. I. Savion Wilkerson gave the best interview, the last media availability media availability of the year for a player. In my opinion, he was just the most honest about what was going on, and a lot of our feelings were justified based upon what he said. But as far as player, I got to go with Jimmy Horn. I do. I think Jimmy's just honest, straight to the point, really nice kid, funny. I always enjoyed talking to him, and I just feel like, you know, I just can't. I mean, all the Sanders are great. I just can't go. I, I just can't take the low-hanging fruit here. I got to go with Sean, though. Shallow Sanders' smile, it might be the best on the planet. The way he kind of <laughs> glances side-eye at you when he's doing that that smile to, like, throw throw uh, some much-loving dirt on his family. I mean, it's hard to go uh, against him. I, I really enjoy Shallow and his personality, and hopefully we do get a chance to, to – interview him a lot this upcoming season. His brother Shador Sanders was named the Buffalo Heart Award winner. And uh, I put a question mark on this, whether he was deserving of that award. Um, I'm really anxious to, to hear if there's any dissenting opinion here. Well, tell, tell us again, tell me again, the criteria. Do you want me to, I'm going to do the actual definition yeah. of the book. And, yeah. and who, and who picks it's this the, is the fans the bench. behind the bench. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So who, what does that mean, though, the fans behind the bench? Is there, like, a specific group or just the collective? Uh, I never understood that. I, I, yeah, yeah, the I'm, award I'm not... is designed to honor the buff who demonstrates grit, determination, and toughness. It's a very short description there. Yeah, and I think there's there's a subset of of fans that that sit in those those first few rows of section 120. I think it is that been there a long um, time. Yeah, that that have kind of started this and carried it forward. So I, I right think on. really really about a half a dozen people that kind of get together and pull their thoughts into that award. I would uh, say, I, yeah, go ahead, William. Oh, I, I, I'm not. Is there controversy about it? I mean, I, it seems to me like you, you know. If anybody's taken a beating and kept on ticking like like Shadur Sanders has in the last ten years in Colorado football, I, I'm I'm not remembering it right now, but my God, you know, but you were yeah. Well, I, I was not trying to create a controversy here. I was just <laughs> sounds like you are Adam. Out there. Right. <laughs> Adam Adam Monster Tiger starts controversy about says Shadur, Shadur Sanders should not have won the Buffalo Heart Award. Shadur well, Sanders I... sucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I didn't hear that from Adam. No, I would say that it has to be Shador because he had every opportunity in the world to throw his offensive line under the bus and he never did it. 
never did it, not one time, and he had every chance to do so week after week, barely being able to stand up from the press conference tables. And, you know, just going back in there, even to – at the end of the year, I felt like his detriment, you know, he's a warrior, and he definitely earned that right. respect for me for sure, even if there's sometimes when it feels like, all right, you know, you don't know when to give up sometimes to, you know, to his detriment. But honestly, you know, I mean, to take 52 sacks and the countless other hits that he took and some big shots at the end of the year, it felt like yeah. it kept getting bigger and bigger. So, yeah, I think he well, was deserving. Yeah. And some of, you know, some of them, you know, like that cheap shot by the uh, defensive tackle at uh, CSU. I mean, they, some of them just teed off on the guy and, and he got, he got right back up. I, I mentioned it earlier before, you know, the one thing I'd like to see him grow in is that on the field leadership and kind of grab that team and kind of, you know, sometimes you just got to lift them up and put them all on your shoulders. Like, like Cepho used to do. And I, I'd like to see some growth in that area. That's yeah. a good point. He really only gets there when he gets pissed off, William. Like right. you only right. see that once he gets upset, it's like, you shouldn't have to get mad to be that guy. You know, and, and, and quite to, to that point, as an offensive line coach, I used to talk to the quarterbacks and say, look, if you got to kick my guys in the backside, you do it. I'm not going to come down on you because that's what you're out there for, man. I think yeah, he's a I little just, nervous uh, to see how that would be perceived, though, nationally, right? If he just had some tirade, you know what I mean? That would I think that's also kind of a double-edged sword. Anyway, sorry, Sean. Oh, no, that's fine. I just don't think that's in his nature. So I don't know that we're going to see that, you know, much more. He's he's very much a, a to-himself uh, kind of guy. I don't, I'm not saying that it's selfish, but he's not the guy that's going to be, you know, the rah-rah guy that's going to be lifting up the rest of his team. I think that's needed, but, you know, as you observe him, he's very much a guy who's who's in his own thoughts, in his own head, kind of cerebral and stands off. You know, I think he gets himself fired up, and sometimes it takes uh, him getting mad to, to do that, but that doesn't really translate out into to getting everybody else going. But you know, in terms of the the award, I think from this team, it he he was the only uh, possible recipient. Um, I think the nature of this year's squad didn't really present what you know would be or has been the the true nature of the award. In that, I'm not sure that there are a lot of players on this year's team that truly bleed black and gold. Um, which you know, to me at least, is part of that. Uh, you know, you you've got to have the toughness, but it's also that that guy that that is just all all in see you um and and I, we just didn't have that out of the the kind of the transitory nature of of this year's squad but from what we did have there there was no no other possible recipient i i think than uh Shador sanders sean real quick to your point about uh uh Shador's personality type tom brady's that guy he's not that loud raw raw guy and it worked out okay for him Oh, yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> he'll light it. He'll you, light his you, teammates up on the sidelines. Right, but do you remember watching him in Michigan? He was not that guy then. I think That's he may fair. have. He may have developed that way, you know, in the NFL because you know you're grown up a grown up guy. Right. But uh, he clearly was not that guy in college. They do need a little bit more of that, though, for sure. I would oh, agree with. I would agree with that. That perspective. Right. Yeah, Shador deserves this award. We all saw that what he went through this year. And uh, as a human being, it was hard to see him go through that week after week. And uh, I would say the other possibility to throw in there would be Trevor Woods, who you guys mentioned as your defensive end of A guy that heard that message in early December and said, you know what, I'm going to be one of the survivors, was one of the first guys to earn his number. So um, I think – you know, if you look at the the past Buffalo Heart Award winners, you know, Trevor Woods deserves some spot on there. And maybe if he comes back next year, he can be part of that award. Uh, let's go to our favorite moment of CU's 2023 football season. There is only one right answer here. Let's go. Is 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 that right? Or who's am, are we am I back on leading lead now? I guess I'm going to pick the wrong moment because it's not even on the football field, quite frankly. To me, to me, the moment that defines this year to me is that uh, uh, the, the, one of the Saturday game days uh, the, the, that's out there and, and uh, primes up primes up on the stage with them and, and the rock comes out. Oh, college game and, day. Yeah, college game day is out there and the rock comes out and it's, oh, my God. It's, and, and I don't know. It, was just, it, would get, it just really touched me. The, the genuine love between those two guys and to see these legend, legend legendary guys. I, I As a longtime CU fan, to see my team celebrated nationally in that moment, 
it, everybody on the planet was watching. And that was my team. That's my coach. That's my guy. And I don't know that that's just a high point to me, even though there are a lot of high points on the field, that that's the one that was sort of like the high watermark to me. Yeah. And I don't know if this is where you're going, Adam, but for me, it, it I think it just has to be the win over TCU in the opener. Um, the, you know, that that's what set the stage for everything else as the season moved on in terms of the level of hype um, and the level of hope that uh, that was coming out of the program. And it's something that hasn't been felt around CU in in so long um, and, and really kind of, uh, you know, spurred that that revitalized fan interest, national interest and, and gave everybody something to crow about. Um, and which we, you know, has been in very short supply uh, around around CU. So that to me, it, it's just that that season opening went over TCU. I got to go. I, first of all, the the week three moment wouldn't have happened without that win over TCU, and then certainly not without the win over Nebraska. But this the, the college game day because I was able to be there on the stage, and I got to see Lee and Kirk and you know Reese and Desmond, and you know it was like. Finally, CU has been like welcomed to college football's pantheon of respect, right? Of of actually being able to mention them and not as the punchline of a joke. That was, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it, but I think it was just that whole weekend, right? Like the setup on Thursday, big noon kickoff, and you had college game day. But I, I think I have to go later, later in the day. I think honestly. <laughs> I don't know. The rock was pretty amazing. That whole moment was great. But when Lil Wayne led the team out in the field, like for me in, in my generation, my age group growing up as like one of the biggest stars ever. So for that guy to lead the team out onto the field, that was a personal favorite moment of like, Oh my God, like what is hap What is happening here? This is almost jumped the shark to a degree, but it was so much fun because see who hasn't had anything like that in so long. That's like, you know what? You're damn right. It's our turn. It's our turn to have a little bit of fun here. And yeah. Okay. It didn't go, you know, the way everything wanted to, but uh, in all reality, probably college game day. Do you know like the depiction of like DNA that that kind of circulates on a documentary? Yeah, the double sure. helix. There, there's there a go. little there's a little molecule in there in my DNA, and I don't know where it started, how it got there, but it hates Nebraska. It just oh does. Now I'm more, I'm more professional than William in terms of my <laughs> hatred towards. I don't know about that, <laughs> but. 3416. There were 8.73 million viewers that tuned into Fox that day to watch Colorado beat Nebraska. And as of today, there's been 4,754 days since Nebraska last spot beat CU. <laughs> and so uh you guys had great answers. No offense to any of you guys, but that for me and in, in my love for CU will never go away based off my history covering this program. But even stronger than that love is the hatred yeah. for Nebraska and the hatred for U of A in that chant. Those things are part of my DNA yeah. and I will not apologize for it. Well, let, let me ask you, Adam. I mean, I, you know, my, my hate for the, uh, okay. I have to control myself before I say something. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm not allowed to put on the front. My hate for the Cornhuskers. Um, goes back to the 80s man because sal was my close friend and the things they said about him and being and you know actually going to uh lincoln a couple times in the 90s and they kicked out one of our windows and you know getting in you know, let me say dancing with a few guys i'll put it that way uh in parking lots and where does your my, my visceral and and you know being on the field and, and uh uh some of those things in in the late eighties on the team and stuff, when we faced them in the, in the derision and stuff from their fans or whatever, where does it come from for you? I don't know. It, and it maybe kind of goes back to 96. I was a high school junior at the time. And I went to an Arizona state game when Jake Plummer was the quarterback for the Sun Devils and they upset Nebraska, which was ranked number one or two at the time. And it, it was interesting. There was somebody next to me that was the nicest person I had ever met and Nebraska lost the game and they just started 
they they turned completely and they were you little piss brain get out of my way let me get into the <laughs> to, it, it was like wow okay but i don't I, I think i had that hatred beforehand but that just kind of cemented it for me yeah I, i've had so many experiences like that and people oh they're nice fans not when they lose man not when they we went out there when we lost when we lost to them seven to nothing uh and jj flanagan fumbled the ball you know with nobody around him at the 50 going in and and we were and that's when they kicked in the window of our car and i'm not going to say we didn't have it coming <laughs> i'm not going to say we were the politest people in the stadium <laughs> but my goodness man you know the 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 that that idea that they're the nicest fans on the planet is just a load of hooey yeah, agreed absolutely agreed absolutely agreed. i will say one of my other favorite moments and from my perspective you know working at the fan and being so in-depth daily with what we do with you know covering broncos or abs or nuggets watching the national media do that with the buffs was so surreal to me like watching them dive in the buffs yep. like it was like the lakers was mind-boggling to me and right. that was part of the reason why it you know the expectations kind of got out of control but also at the same time you know, from my perspective, doing that stuff every day and and being involved in coming up with different storylines, whether it's on the field or off the field and different little things and, and the amount of interest, I think just the amount of interest had to be my favorite thing because, I mean, yeah. gosh, guys, it's been so long. You know, you know, like one day, and I'm 59, man. That's the one day in my life I can remember the boss being bigger than the Broncos. It's 100% true, by the way. Yeah. A hundred percent true, even for us. It, and it caught a lot of the people that I work with by surprise. I kept telling you, don't be surprised. This is the biggest story in sports. And that's, it, it, that's why he won sportsman of the year. I mean, if you go back, I was trying to think of alternatives or other people you could have given it to. No one has achieved anything greater in sports than what he's done this year. And that's why he won it. And that's why it will probably be more fun as a CU fan Wins and losses are important. We all know that. And next year, they've got to put up or shut up. But there are still wins as a human being to enjoy throughout this process, right? Uh, William, you referenced to, tuning in ESPN's game day and seeing that reaction towards Colorado. And so that's part of it, too, in that we're going to nitpick some of the imbalances we see within this football program. But that does not take away from the excitement and kind of the belief that Coach Prime is the best person for this job at this time. Right. And, and, and you know, especially in comparison to anybody else that was possible to have at the time last year. And, you know, none, none of those people would have changed the roster and brought in the, the excitement. And, and quite frankly, even now, after a disappointing season, you still let you still you still wake up. At, you know, I still wake up every morning, and pull up buff stampede and go, OK, what happened? What happened? Yep. Which you didn't do that a year ago. You're like. I don't even want to look, man. Agreed. And, and, you know, as we, you know, I mentioned it earlier too, but none of, none of all the changes and all the stuff that's happened behind the curtains happens without, without prime. Um, right. So it, it's, you know, regardless of, of how this plays out in, in retrospect, when we're looking back at it in five years, um, the, the, the excitement that he's brought, inside the the administration inside the university as well as outside of the fan base is what's going to pay dividends for for the next decade